Hello, it's Scott Manley here. By now, many of you space fans will have seen the movie First Man, about the life of Neil Armstrong, and it's a movie that I highly recommend. It, it looks great, and it covers many of the big events in his life and gives you details inside the cockpits and the spacecraft that he flew that you haven't really seen elsewhere. However, I'm going to say that it's not perfectly accurate and you should take many of the features, so many of the lines, with a bit of a pinch of salt. But anyway, the movie starts with Neil inside an X-15 research plane being carried under the wing of a B-52, specifically Balls 8, the carrier aircraft for this experimental aircraft program. Now, the X-15 program was intended to explore hypersonic speeds and re-entry. So uh, they, would act, they built three of them, and the flight in question was carried out in X-15 number 3 in April of tw uh, 1962. Now, number three had actually had a problem early on during development. It had had an engine test on the ground with the pilot, Scott Crossfield, sitting in the seat. And uh, yeah, the engine had exploded. <laughs> and the, the aircraft had obviously been seriously damaged. But amusingly, when the press asked the pilot about, uh, you know, were you ever in any danger, he you know, bravely responded, saying he never felt in any danger. In fact, the worst thing that happened was that the fire department got his trousers wet. Of course, the newspapers ran with the headline, Experimental Aircraft Explodes, Pilot Wets Pants. With this aircraft seriously damaged, it had to go back and get repaired. But of course, the other two aircraft were flying and new features were, that were being developed ended up getting integrated into X-15 number 3. One particular piece of hardware was the MH-96 electronic flight control system. This was actually ori originally intended or being in, uh, targeted to be flown inside the Dinosaur X-20 aircraft. That would be a fully orbital mini space shuttle type of aircraft that the Air Force was developing. It had been tested on other aircraft, but the X-15 presented a unique opportunity because the X-15 being a rocket-powered experimental aircraft would fly at extremely high speeds and extremely high altitudes. So Neil was actually one of the primary engineers and test pilots that worked on this. In fact, Neil Armstrong would fly all f the first four flights of X-15 number three with the MH-96 uh, system on board. Because the X-15s flew to such high altitudes, there would be large portions of the flight where they were essentially in near vacuum and the aerodynamic control surfaces would provide no control at all. So the X-15 also came with a reaction control thruster system that was fueled by hydrogen peroxide. So the aircraft would actually come with two sets of controls, one for the aerodynamic surfaces and then when you got to altitude, the pilots would switch over to the RCS controls. The MH-96, in theory, would be able to integrate both of these control systems onto a single stick, and it would do a whole lot more than this. It could also provide consistent rotation rates for the same uh, stick deflection by adjusting the flap deflect or the control surface deflection depending upon velocity and aerodynamic um, or you know, aerodynamic speeds and everything. Uh, it also had things like a G-limiter. And one of the things that Neil wanted to test on this fourth flight was whether the G-limiter worked. Test plan for the flight was a standard boost up to altitude with a number of control and response tests on the way up and down. Things started out rough, with Neil's post-flight comments describing the turbulence as the worst he had ever experienced in a B-52. Of course, this fits in with the movie, which seems to be shaking the entire audience. Launch was at 45,000 feet. The X-15 fell away from the aircraft, lit its engine, and then proceeded into a 30-degree powered climb. During the climb, Neil tested various things, such as the MH-96's alpha hold mode. That's where it would hold a specific angle of attack to the, in the airstream. There were actually some questions about the pitch angle he was holding with the people on the ground reading a higher angle. Neil stuck to what his aircraft was saying and it seemed that that was the right value. I mean, it would actually be a big deal if he picked the wrong angle because the aircraft was so powerful and the distance is so long. It could really end up with the aircraft overshooting and end up nowhere near the runway, which was important because after the engine shut down, the X-15 was a glider and they had to get back to the runway. 
But yeah, Neil trusted the onboard instrumentation and it uh, seems that that was the right decision because the aircraft hit a peak altitude of 207,500 feet, slightly higher than the 205,000 they had planted, planned, but uh, still well within the errors they expected. The peak speed was Mach 5.31. The MH-96 performed excellently, providing good control in both the atmosphere and in zero pressure, we have pressures of one ten thousandth of sea level, automatically driving the RCS. In fact, it's believed that it drove the RCS a bit too much because on the way back down, they got a warning light indicating that the peroxide supply to the, the thrusters were getting low, but uh, the engine actually had spare peroxide that could be used for uh, that could be transferred over and Neil just did that. At 90,000 feet Neil noticed smoke coming into the cockpit. This was believed to be from paint burning off due to the atmospheric heating but the real problem that got Neil into trouble was testing the G-limiter on the MH96. As he hit this thicker atmosphere, he pulled back on the stick and entered a 4G climb, and he was probably paying attention to that G-meter on the left side of the cockpit. He was wanting to see the control system kick in and drop that off, but while focusing on that, not only did he just pull out of the dive, but he kept pulling up and then essentially began climbing again. He didn't bleed off as much energy as they would have normally done and he headed back into the thinner parts of the atmosphere. By the time he noticed, he was heading past the landing area at Mach 3 in air that was too thin for the aircraft to turn. He tried to roll the aircraft and turn it, but it wouldn't turn because there wasn't enough air to support it. By the time the aircraft dropped back down, far enough that the aerodynamic control surfaces were really giving him some lift. He was over the San Gabriel Mountains north of uh, LA. Now if the aircraft hadn't started turning at that point, Neil would have been in real trouble because the only place out there that he could have landed it would have been LA International Airport. And they're not really set up for experimental aircraft, especially considering that the X-15 landed on skids and that would not work so well on a concrete runway. But yeah, good thing is it did turn around, but the bad news was that he was 45 miles south of the runway he was supposed to use. After the powered portion of the flight, the X-15 is essentially just a glider and flights would be planned so that after the aircraft shed most of their velocity, they would be pretty much over Edwards Air Force Base. The aircraft could fly a lazy spiral into the target runway. The X-15 is actually a terrible glider. It has a glide ratio of about 4 to 1 and there aren't many aircraft worse than that. <coughs> Space shuttle. Uh, but this, yeah, this put the intended landing site way out of range and it gave Neil you know, seconds to decide on where he could go. Now, Palmdale Airport was a possibility, but yeah, you know, landing skids are not great. There were a couple of other lake beds in the area, but... Neil decided he would try and stretch his glide all the way to the south lake bed at Edwards, 12 miles south of the runway that he would normally have landed at. Neil carefully managed his aircraft's approach to get as much distance out of the altitude that he had, and he did successfully bring the aircraft to the smooth surface of the lake bed at the south end of Edwards. The chase pilots assigned to him did actually catch up with him just as he was making final approach. And uh, in post-flight uh, debriefing, they were asked, how close was the X-15 to the trees near the lake bed? Their answer was, about 100 feet, either side. The flight ended at 12 minutes, 28.7 seconds, the longest flight of the X-15 program. This would be the sixth of seven flights that Neil would fly by the X-15. And by the end of 1962, Neil had of course transferred to the astronaut program at uh, NASA and would be headed off towards Gemini. As for X-15 number three, on its 65th flight in 1967, piloted by Michael J. Adams, it would unfortunately go into a supersonic spin. The pilot did recover into a dive, but was then unable to get it out of the dive, and the aircraft eventually broke up in flight, becoming the only X-15 to be lost in flight. The other two X-15s completed their program and are now on display in museums. And of course, First Man is still in movie theaters. I still say you should check it out. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.